Hello, I'd like to welcome you to this tutorial series uh, with Ms. Tankala. Uh, in this series, we're going to uh, look at some of the examples uh, pertaining to uh, the embedded systems. Particularly, we are focusing on uh, the Atmega microcontroller, and in this case, we're looking at Mega Microcontroller uh, 32. Okay. So uh, the the outline for what we can discuss is what you see right here. So we're going to look at uh, different uh, types of instructions that are found on the Atmega chip. Uh, we're going to look at the data transfer instructions. We're going to look at the arithmetic uh, instructions, logic instructions, rotate, shift, compare, jump, and branch instructions. We're also going to look at some subroutine instructions. Uh, we're also going to deal with the port processing instructions. And then we're also going to look at uh, the AVR Studio examples uh, for instruction sets. But also in the end, we're also going to look at the indirect addressing with port processing instructions. But I must confess that this video is going to be divided into two, uh, where that is that we're going to look at the first part and as well as the second part the first part will be pretty much the first part will be to do with uh just the basic instructions and some examples but this component right here which is the indirect addressing we'll do it in the second part so really quickly let me just go into some of the uh, instructions for example when we talk about the data transfer instructions what do we look at? So basically, I'd like to make some assumptions here. When I write RD, this is the destination register, and when I write RR, is the source register. And whenever I write a small i, this, uh, whenever I write i, uh, so this is the source register. Whenever I write k, uh, is constant, and uh, the small k will re represent a memory location. All right, so when we talk about the data transfer instructions, uh, these are some of the examples that you see right here. So, for example, there is a move instruction where we start with the move, then RD, comma, RR in this case. All right, so this means move the constant. Uh, so, miss, oh, sorry, sorry, this means move the content of this RR to RD. So whenever you have an instructions that is uh, consisting of two registers as we, we see, because we've seen that uh, in that mega, we have uh, registers from R0 to R31. And the move instructions, whenever you see an instructions where we have move RD, so like we said, this is a destination register and this is the source register. The RR. So we're saying move the content of this register RR, move it into the destination register, which is RD. All right, as simple as all that. And then there's also the uh, LDI uh, instruction. Now, this LDI instruction is an instruction that takes place between uh, a register and actually a constant, as you may see right here. So this one, which is saying RD, K. This means that this means you move the constant k into RD. Um, and then it's very much also important to note that this LDI instruction actually works with registers from R16 to R31. And then k as a number, it can be a number that ranges from 0 to 255. All right. Now we have this instruction right here that you see again. It's the RD, uh, X, Y, Z. Now, I want to mention that the X, Y, Z instructions, these are mainly used uh, in the AVR microcontroller as pointers. All right, now we're going to have a detailed discussion of that, but what I want you to understand that a pointer is <clears throat> basically, in this case, registers from R26 uh, to R31. And it's very much important to understand that the X, Y, Z are composed of two parts. There's the X low and there's X I. There's a Y low and there's the, also the uh, Y uh, high. 
But what we mean mainly is that these registers, whenever we use them, we mainly use them for indirect addressing. Now, indirect addressing is something that we're going to see some examples later on. But right now, suffice to say that whenever we are using these uh, registers, uh, whenever they come into uh, play, mainly they are pointing to uh, a memory location uh, in the uh, memory files, such as the SRAM. So we use them as pointers. So mainly they contain the address uh, of the address of a particular cell in memory, which may have the data that we want to retrieve information from. So whenever, so when we do that, this actually simply means bring data from memory into RD. Now, um, so this could be a bit confusing right now because it's too general. What we mean is, so whenever we do this kind of an instruction where we have an RD comma X, so X may have the content of the memory location. And then whenever we want to fetch data from that memory location into a destination register such as the RD, this could be registers from R0 to uh, maybe R25, then we could actually uh, do this. We can use the LD, RD. And now you see me use this uh, instruction very often. And I want you to pay attention whenever it takes place because X or Y will have the memory location and that memory location may have the data that we want to retrieve from that memory location so this x will be loaded or y will be loaded with the cell location which has got the information but when we call this kind of a function is we mean that whatever uh, information that memory location has uh, where x is pointing to that information will be actually loaded into this destination register. And we'll be able to see this as well as we come on. But also these this other type of instruction where we have we do this pretty much the same thing, but we have the X plus and Y plus and then Z plus. So this actually simply means that bring into the destination register, which is RD to the cell to uh, so bring into RRD which is the destination register the uh, content of the memory location where X uh, is pointing to but plus one all right so what I mean by this is that if we have for example uh, if we have a scenario in which let's say that the cell location oh sorry this is a bit clumsy let's say that we have a cell uh, a cell location in memory and its net location is zero times zero zero uh, six zero okay so now we all know that this is uh, a cell location according to the ISRAM we have this cell location so what LD will mean is that when we write LD, all right, now guys, I'm not so good at this uh, writing part. It's kind of messing me up. But what we mean is that if we are going to have LD, all right, and then we have RD, all right. So when we have the comma um, uh, uh, X plus, so if X was initially pointing to uh, this cell location without this increment, it means that the X plus, this will become, this one is like our reference cell, all right? Our reference cell in memory. But then when we have X plus, what we're actually saying is that bring into RRD the content of LD, Sorry there, but that is kind of clumsy. Zero. So you are actually bringing into RD the content of zero, zero, six, one. All right. So because now 
what you're bringing into memory is the post increment. So the X will point further to uh, 0061 because then you're adding a one. So it will take the information, it will take the data from the next cell location where this was your initial reference. But then now when you add a plus, it actually means that it's now pointing to the next cell location, which is X plus. Now you see here, this is a very useful tool, guys. And we'll see, uh, I'm using this writing part for the very first time. So it's kind of clumsy writing right here. But it's very much important that you understand that, of course, uh, when we deal with uh, the when we deal with the way it is right here, this is without any increment. So if, let's say, for example, we're taking, uh, let's say, for example, X uh, in this first one contains, let's say that X is, in this case, because we've said that they are pointers, let's say X is pointing to 0, 0, uh, 6, sorry about that, 6 is 0, then the post increment plus 1 will mean that x is pointing to the next address, which is 0, 0, 6, 1, right? That's actually what it means, right? So, uh, so this is what it means to have an instruction like this. So it actually simply means that x is drawing information to the next address um, after its reference address, right? So after the register has been post incremented and we increment this. So the analogous of this, of this instruction is this one. So simply means that if you have the, so this one is bring into the destination register, the data uh, uh, from a place where x from the cell where x is pre-decremented pre-decremented that means that the address before the reference address all right so this is where uh, we mean okay so this is pre-decremented now also we have uh, a scenario where we don't have to go just the plus way of doing things we can have a specific value so suppose that we just want to refer to uh, a memory or remember that I said the XYZ that I use for uh, indirect addressing. They're not used for direct addressing. Mainly we use them for indirect addressing. But the post increment and that pre decrement may not just be enough to reference the cell. Sometimes we want is to we want to reference to a certain memory location by adding a specific number to it. And basically, we can also do that through the LDD instruction, where you add uh, a specific number. And apparently, this instruction works only with the Y and Z. All right? Yeah. So uh, this is where how it works, guys, for these basic instructions. And these have to do with the data transfer instructions. But we could have actually some more as well. So we have the LDS instruction. Now, I told you that when I write a small k, it simply means that's a memory location. And so you may just want to bring data directly from the memory location uh, without necessarily have to go through the, uh, the x, y, z. All right. So is there such an instruction? Yes, there is. Uh, so here, for example, you can see that we're bringing information from this memory location uh, such as... Uh, uh, maybe the 0060, we're taking that information and we're bringing it directly from the memory location to the destination register. All right, and this is such an instruction for you. Uh, so, um, so now we also have the STXYZ, uh, so this will actually simply means we'll get data from the register and store in memory pointed by XYZ. Right, so you see the LDS being used very often, and the 
STS and I'll talk about the STS later on. But just right now, just appreciate the statement what they mean, all right? And we'll have more examples to look at this. And then we also have, so since here we're taking into the register directly, we'll also have a instruction that takes into the memory location, but not directly, but for this one, it's like it's indirectly. You're taking information from the register, but then X contains the cell location or the memory location to which you want to deposit the content of ROR. Okay, so we also have this one where we're actually storing uh, data into memory. Uh, in this case, we're storing data into memory to a pointer, uh, to a point where the cell, uh, where the indirect addresses are pointing to, but in this case, we're pointing with an offset. Again, this instruction has to do only with Y and Z, all right? So, um, so sorry about this kind of writing. We just kind of missed it. Uh, but we are very clear about this, um, uh, that that's, that's the one with actually an offset. Now, here is the point where we are also trying to uh, tell you that you can actually bring data directly from the register here into the sorry about that so we can bring directly data directly into memory from the register right so now these two instructions uh, if you check this one right here, it's actually analogous uh, with this one. This one loads into the destination register directly from memory. So now we want to load directly into memory uh, from the register, all right? So you can see here there's the STS and there's the LTS. So whenever you want to load directly data from, let's say, for example, you could have... Um, Let's say you have, uh, uh, L you could have LDS, LDS. Oh my goodness, this is very bad. Huh? Can't really buy anything here. So I have R zero, all right, a comma zero zero uh, six zero, all right. So now you can see here that if we have R0060, this is a memory location, uh, as you well know, and we can be loading data directly from this memory location to the register R0, all right? And we can also have the STS command in which we are loading data directly from uh, just this, sorry about my mouse, is not really doing a good job here. So we have, we may have our zero. Um, we may have our zero, 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 maybe six, one. And then we may load information directly into the register, into the, we may load the HTS, we may load data directly from a, from a register such as we say R, maybe R16 or something like that, right? Okay, so we could have these commands. Now, the reason why I've referred to this because these I've used them quite often, especially the STS has been used quite often in this in these examples that I'm giving you. All right, so real quickly, let's just again move to the other types of instruction instructions because this is quite a quite a lot. So we have also the arithmetic instructions. Now for the arithmetic instructions, as you can see, the add instruction, this adds between the content of RD and the content of RR. And then we also have the subtraction, which subtracts the content. Uh, in fact, so here what we're saying is that we're saying add the content of this, sum the, sum the content of RD and RR, but the results store in RD. Here subtract also the content of this subtract the content of RR from RD and the results are stored in RD, right? 
So those have the increment, this increments the quantity of RD. The decrement function also, this decrements the quantity of RD. Now here, guys, I want to mention here is that usually we use this increment function, for example, we may just increment. For example, if we increment uh, uh, a particular register, RD will has been initialized with zeros. What this simply means if whenever you write uh, increment increment the content of a register, let's say R16, uh, you see that you are actually if this was preloaded with zeros, uh, usually the assumption is that the initial value are actually zeros. So you'll be incrementing its content from zero to the maximum possible number before it overflows, which is 255, right? And we'll talk about this because this increment technique can be very useful, especially when we're trying to introduce delays uh, in, a, in, a, in a program. And you see uh, it very much often used. But I also want to tell you that we can increment something and then you can test these uh, increment in the register. You can test them with the uh, a corresponding value that has taken place in the status register. And we'll talk about all of this later on. But right now, I just appreciate the fact that this is called the increment. And there's also what we call the decrement function. So the this decrement function, this is really what it does is that it begins to, uh, you may have loaded uh, maybe the content of a register with a, very, a particular number. Uh, in this case, for example, you may have loaded R16, you may have loaded with the value equals maybe 255, right? And so the, the decrement function will actually mean that you begin to subtract one every time till this this value reaches a value which is a zero for example right so you may start counting you may start decrementing from zero from 255 to uh to zero so it doesn't have to be necessarily 255 it could be just a number that you've loaded into the register and then you begin to decrement uh to the uh to down now, the reason why you would want to do that, I'll show you guys also later on because there are functions such as the break if not echo command, for example, the breaking if not echo command, or the break if echo. You may want to uh, decrement something. Uh, sorry, you may want to decrement the value of R16, for example, and then you want to. Uh, you want to a little bit uh, test if it is not equal. So if it is not equal to zero or you want to do something. But again, there will be dedicated examples on how we use the decrement and the increment function. But right now, just suffice to say that this is what they do. This one de increments the content of a register and this one also decrements the content of a register. Then there's also what we call the negative neg rd negates the value is that gets the value stored. There's also this multiplication uh, in which also we are also trying to approach these concepts. Now what we call logic instructions as well, which could be actually used as well. So the logic instructions, these perform the actual uh, logic instructions in the register. So what I mean, what it means is that this carries the and operation of RD and R and stores the result in RD. So now what this means, guys, again here is that you may have, if you have RD, let's say for example, RD has got uh, a binary value such as 0, B, uh, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. Uh, one two three one two three one and then you have got R R. Uh, this is really missing yet we have zero b maybe zero 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 
okay so zero watt now here we have equals also zero there should be eight all right so if you perform the and operation of these two what you're going to have you're going to have ones right because we know that the and operation uh performs uh if two if you and one and one you get one if you and one and zero you still get one so you're still going to get ones uh zero b the results will be zero b uh, where you have zero b and then you have one 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 oh that is one one so the result will be this but then the results is going to be stored in this destination register re register after you've done this operation so is the all and so is the exclusive orchid right Okay, so real quickly, let's again go to the uh, other types of instructions that we have. All right, so we are also we also have these instructions. Most of these instructions maybe and will not touch touch them, but it's very good. It's very important that you understand and. Uh, you appreciate them because some of them will really greatly apply them and some of them you may not see us if there's a need to would apply them and it's very important to understand that they exist so we have the rotate and shift instructions for example this is this shift to the right and shift to the left and, sh and the shifted bit goes to the carry flag now what this carry flag is this is um, a, a flag that is found in the status register the status registers contains the flags that carry out when you're shifting the bits to the right or left. Let's say you're shifting to the right. It means that you will have bits that are being shifted. Some of them may end up spilling over to the carry flag. And uh, we'll be able to see some of these things. We have the row left, row right. This instructions bits are shifted to the left. And right but the carry bit enters in the end performing rotating action right so um, again this is something that you want to look at uh, with an example but of course what we mean is that in the left sh shift register this is where the beats are just going uh, they're just going and they're heading towards the status register where they will affect some carry flag but with this one is where there's a rotation, right? The beat, as it reaches the edge, it tries to go back and then begins the input. It becomes the first input to the train of beats that are flowing. So we'll look at this again. So we have got also the shift to the right, where the shift instruction goes to the, to the carry flag. But the most significant figure is actually replicated, all right? Okay, so these are some of the uh, rotate uh, shift instructions. Guys, I've actually posted a, even a book. You have some of these things. If you want to see how they are used, some of these instructions, you can actually take a look at the textbook that I just forwarded to you. But right now, let's just also look at the compare instructions. Now, you've seen me use very often the compare instructions. So this compare instruction compares between the content of the register and the constant so what it simply means is that you're trying to compare if these two if this constant is equal to what is uh, contained in this instruction so here i just said this instruction performs rd minus k but the result is not stored anywhere but reflected in the status register yes uh, something like that but it's very also much important to note that the cpi instruction uh, compares if the content of the register is actually equal to that all right compare if equal so if they are equal then you want to perform a certain function if they are not equal you also want to perform a certain function but now notice this is a comparison between a register and a constant but then here whenever we are comparing between the two content of registers then we cannot use cpi then we just use the CP, all right? This performs again, the results are stored anywhere, I'm not using the status register, but in short, this simply means is the content of this guy equal to that guy. Okay, so we have the jump and branch category instructions. 
the jump label now guys we so the jump label in fact in the uh, AVR uh, Mac controllers the jump is actually usually written as the GMP all right and you've seen us very often than not use the ARA GMP all right so ARA GMP is the one that is popularly used and the difference uh, between the two so the jump could just be uh, jumping to uh, a certain label but relative jump is normally used because it is actually relative to uh, any posts that you any label that you want to uh, jump to because if you want to jump forward maybe you can always use the jump but the relative jump can jump forward and actually backwards and it's usually written as jump jmp and then it's followed by uh, a label so a label it's where you want the jump instruction to go to right so this is unconditional jump instruction the program jumps to a label unconditionally okay so relative jump may jump to a label whether that label wherever that label is whether it's before the uh whether it's at the end or where it's supposed to go back or where it's supposed to go forward now fine you see how these are applied as well we have the break if echo command or the break if not echo command now whenever you carry out an instruction such as cpi where you want to compare if the content of rd is equal to uh, a constant value uh, oftentimes the note you see even in the next examples i'm going to show you that the break if echo command and the break if not echo command would actually go hand in hand with a cpi command or cp for example if you compare the content of rd to k now one of the questions that comes was so what do i do if they are equal right so or if they're not equal so usually when you have the cpi as the first instruction you may just want to follow it by the break if equal or break if not equal because if you compare the decision that should happen in an event that what we're comparing is really equal then we can go to the for example we can say okay so if i compare the content of rd to k if these two are equal then i want to break if equal so we're saying compare the content of rd and k if they are equal break if equal to a certain label that you want the program to go to so you may have the cpi to compare and then the break if equal command to make a decision if they are equal and if they are not equal the break if equal command may be ignored and the next instruction could perform now the break if not equal command could actually also work with the cpr for example it's a scenario where you're comparing the two contents right and if they are equal if they are not equal then you want to make a decision that's why here i wrote that if the previously compared instructions are equal then branch to a label or if the previous compared instructions are not equal then you can actually go to a label okay now there are other types of instructions of course like the sampling team uh, instructions this is the where for example we may use the functions such as the call label uh, where you call the you call we use the functions such as the call this instruction branches to subroutine under a label and performs an instruction under that when the subroutine has finished executing the program returns to the previous section it should have continued it to if the instruction was not called or the program uh, continues so read that the read instruction is put at the end of each subroutine to make the program go back now guys you will see me very often that time the note whenever we are talking about the call function and uh, we want the program to go and perform a certain uh, maybe subroutine instruction where we call where the call label is so it means a call we follow it by a label but I want to mention that every time you use uh, the call function you may just want to make sure that the start pointer is always declared. Now, what the start pointer really is, I'm going to have a detailed discussion because the core function may not work without the start pointer. And then we have also that whenever you reach at the end of that subroutine, you can always remember to retain, right? So retaining to 
uh, the place where you ended from. In other words, you continue from where you ended from. Okay. And we have also a detailed discussion on that. So here is now, let's look at some of the port processing instructions and actually examples that we want to look at. So for example, there's some useful port processing instructions as you write your assembly code. Uh, these instructions are very important. For example, there's what we call the SBI uh, input output register comma bit. Now what these instructions does, it, it says the bit mentioned um, high. For example, if you talk about the port, right, if you say SBI port B comma zero, so what you're simply saying here is that port set port B zero high, okay? This is simple as all that. So if I say SBI port B comma one, this will simply means set port B one high because what is setting is the SBI. So we have also the CBI, which is analogous which is again talks to the input output ports comma bit this instruction clears the bit mentioned and becomes lower so if we say cbi port b comma zero we're saying set port b low okay then there's the sbi instruction that is sbi input output port comma bit now let me mention here that whenever you're using the sbi c and the sbi s be careful here you notice that when you say cbi we follow it by a port let's say port b in this case and then we follow it by the index on that port remember this port b0 up to port b7 right so in this case we're referring to port b0 and then the instruction says clear the bit but the sbic it actually tests if the bit of a particular port is cleared, and usually the SBIC goes, is followed by not the port, but by the pin value. Okay, so here it is. So bit, this bit, it tests a bit in the input and skips the next instruction if the bit is cleared. So the SBIC says skip the next instruction if the bit is what? If the bit is cleared. And how that is applied, there's an example that I'm gonna show you just after this, how we apply some of these instructions. So the SBIC skip the next if the bit on port B D0 is cleared, and the SBIS, that's the structure. This is test a bit in an input output region, really skips the next instruction if the bit is actually what a set. So this looks for a zero and this looks for a one. Where on port D0? Okay, so SBI has been skipped in if the bit on port D0 is, is what? Is set. So we have also the LDI register comma number. So here is the point. So this loads the immediate number into the register. So when we have the LDI, this one loads the immediate number into the register. All right, and then we have seen actually this instruction before. All right, so now let's just continue uh, we have also these are some of the instructions you can see there's a clear register this simply means load zeros into the register and SER it register this is the content of register it moves ones into that register out register this moves the number from a register and moves it into an input output so there you've seen this we've used it in ports Oftentimes, there's also the in instruction which actually reads this copies the number from input uh, into a register. So, when we are actually saying win in a register, and now mainly the in instruction is followed by a pin as well. So, I'm going to show you an example on how we are actually applying the in instruction as well. So, let's look at the AVR Studio itself. So when you actually open the AVR Studio, the first thing that you want to do to write your code is that you go into new and you actually choose a project that you want. All right. And then from there, you can decide uh, what you want to develop. Do you want to develop a C++ program or an assembly? And in this case, since we're looking at assembly, we can actually put assembly. We can choose assembly. And in here, this is where you give a name uh, actually of your project 
what is it that it's got so here since we are pulled now here this is where you choose your chip and your chip name here that make it the two and then you can choose it or you can search right there to locate uh, the actual chip and then you can select and once you select this is what you will be visited with so whatever you see here in green and this basically shows you that this is the name of a project that you had called and it was created on this day and the author who the author is but let me mention that what has been pulled between the forward uh, slash and the backslash and some stars these codes or these words they will not run as part of the program <coughs> all right they will be um they are just like comments right now the four slash now this is exactly what i'm explaining now whenever you are beginning to program so that's a platform that's the atmail studio that's where you do your programming but now so after this empty space below the empty space now you need to start writing your program but the question that comes is the where do you start writing from right so uh that becomes a bit uh, tricky so the first thing that you should always remember whenever you're starting to write a program is that you should think about the programming template now the programming template these are the steps that you need at least from step one to step four you will do these steps without necessarily thinking all right because we think in the main program so i'll walk you through the main uh the programming template real quickly and what it is composed so the programming template actually composed of the first step the first thing that you want to put in your code is a program function so the program function starts with the dot include so whenever i write my semicolon that's just a comment so when i write the dot include n32 def dot kit now this is a live code if you mess up with this code then the program will start having problems to compile so the first thing is that we need to include the library files for that mega 32 all right now apparently this is how you do it this is how you call this function whenever you do the dot include it means include all the data definition files for the at mega 32 if it was at mega 6 i would say m if it was at mega 16 i would say m16 dev.ink but since we're dealing with at mega 32 so we say m32 then the second thing is the second step is called the declaration section in the declaration section this is where you just define conversion names uh, for your ports or for your registers for example if you start with a dot def temp r is equal to r16 this, this simply means that you are defining r16 and you're going to be calling it as temp and in this case dot eco late con it means that you're actually defining your port as late con so notice how we've actually differentiated when i'm calling a register i started with a dot def and when i'm calling a port i'm starting with dot eco let code so it's very much important that we appreciate this point so there's the first point the second and this is the third point so the third point you need to write just one instruction and in this we're just saying rgmp in it all right so in this case uh after the declaration section you want to be wise to write a command such as relative jump to jump to a label called initialization the reason being is that what are we jumping from? So now I want to mention here that there are about actually almost about 29. Now we need to check the data set of the vectors and interruptions that are actually found instructions, vectors and interruption instructions that are found on the at mega theta. So if you don't define this RGMP in it, what is going to happen is that the program will delay will actually so will delay from uh, being uh, so it will be delayed and derailed actually so what is going to happen is that the program will spend time in performing uh, all those vectors and interruptions that are invisible before the initialization section so the program will unnecessarily take long so to do that in order to keep that kind of an incident 
So what you do, you just quickly, quickly, when it starts at the start of the program, you say add, add a GMP in it so that it jumps all the instructions and you're directing it to go and perform the initialization section, which is right here. All right, so now in this case, of course, we are just putting some dummy things, but uh, it's very much important that when the program actually is jumping to the initialization section. So the initialization section, this is where you define two things. You define the status of your ports, that's one, and you also define the direction that those ports will have. Remember that these ports on the microcontroller uh, can be configured as input ports or they can be configured as an output port apart from the other functionalities uh, that they do. All right, so for example, a quick one, this is where now you can load. So what this LDI temp means is that you're loading these zeros into a register called temp, and then you're putting those zeros to, uh, to the port B. So there is a relationship between the port and the ordinary register, but you can't say LDI port B comma zero BDPV. The program will generate an error. So you have to load first the data first of all into the register, and then from the register, you load it into uh, the port. All right. And so this is exactly what we're doing. We're loading ones into the temporal register, and then we're putting those ones into the data directory for port B. So what are we saying about port B? It says that we've configured port B, we've actually made it low status, but we've made sure that it's an output port. And the way we do output ports is by loading ones into the direction register. Now, I do want to actually also uh, take it that most of you have uh, this uh, kind of explanation on the uh, ports, but I also have another lesson uh, in which I'll make a video on the uh, on the ports as well. But the assumption is that you really understand what's going on here. And I'll take uh, my time also because I've taught some of these things. But I will just real quickly just go to uh, now the main program. So once you've done line number one, line number two, line number three, line number four, then you can actually come to the main program. So this is the structure of the main program. And then we can talk about some of the things. So no big deal right here, but I wanted to just make sure that I show you the template, how it looks like. So the template consists of five steps. So there's a five step number one, two, actually three, four, and then five, because five is actually the main program. Okay, now, I would like to uh, maybe for the sake of uh, the video uh, allow me to just stop right here and in the next lesson uh, I'm going to show you uh, this example right here right or maybe let's just maybe go to one example uh, that I want to show you and I'll jump because the document is too big actually so Let's just real quickly maybe look at a sample example uh, in which uh, we do some of these things. So, I, like I said, instructions to do with indirect addressing, I'll actually talk to you about them later on. But right now, let's just try to look at this example, all right? So now the question says, so write a simple program to switch on an LED connected to port A0 in reaction to a button placed on port B0. So what we have is that we actually have this LED right here and it's connected to port A0 and then we also have port B0, this button right here connected to port B0. Now the question says we need to write uh, a program whereby when we switch on uh, the button, the LED should come up. Now, I want to mention also right here that we're actually using assembly because this is what we, we're dealing with in this. So now, to do this, we have actually chosen that we're going to use the port processing instructions, but then we've chosen, we've singled out some of the instructions we're going to use. We're going to see if we can put together the CPI 
the RGMP and the break commands to be able to fulfill uh, the given question. All right, so uh, let's just quickly go to the code itself. So the first thing that I've done, so this is the written code uh, that I've put down for you, guys. So the first thing that we've done, so this is my assumption. So I've done uh, some assumptions. So I've made that all port Bs in this case, uh, they are, are all input ports, all right? And um, all port A's, I assume that there are all output ports, all right? The reason for assuming, I'm gonna tell you much later, but right now, just appreciate that. This is that all port A's are output ports, but then we have an LED connected to port A0. And then in this case, also we're saying all port B's are input ports, but we have only one port, which was port B0, to which we've actually connected the button. Now, I've been talking about this in class, so what we're going to do, the advantage that we're going to create, let's say that we, so we shall need, so first, basically before I go into that, we shall need, since we've got two ports at play, port A and port B, port B is going to be on the input side and port A is going to be on the output side, then now, GG Adiva. All right, guys. So I'm going to now quickly, quickly, quickly. Yes. Yes. Now I want to go through the the problem itself. So what's the solution to the problem? The solution to the problem is that the first thing we we include the program function, and the second thing that we do is basically to uh, declare. We just declared the registers as temp so we say temp is equal to r16 and then here on step number three this is where i jump to the initialization section now the function of the initialization section is to show which ports are input ports and which actual ports are going to be also our output ports so in this case we say that port b is actually our uh, input port because that's where we've connected the button and then we're saying that port you were and then we're going to say that port a you will i'm making a video and then we're saying that port a our port a uh, is an output port and our port b is also our input port all right so the first thing that we need to do in the initialization section what do we need to do if we want to configure ports as input port? So the first thing is we load zeros into the temporal register. And then from there, we're going to output in the direction register. So this, when we do this, we're actually saying configure port B as an input by loading zeros. And we have to also talk to the status of the port. How do we talk the status of a port? Well, we load ones into this, and then we're saying all port Bs are ones. Now, strategically speaking, why do we load ones into port Bs? Now, he's, these are input ports because we've talked to the data direction registers. Now, the data direction registers are the DDRs R B, right? The DDR B, the data direction register which is the DDRB in this case when we load zeros it means that these ports are configured as input ports right when we load ones to a particular port to a particular data direction it means we're configuring the ports as what output ports in this case like i said the assumption is that i'm loading all zeros into the data direction registers of port B because they're input ports. But now for the status, always remember you configure two things about the port. You configure the direction and you also configure the status. Now status for port B, we've given it them what? We've given them high status. All right, the reason why we're doing that, remember that we, whenever you, if I'm going to write a one on port B zero, and the rest are also ones. What this simply means is that if I'm going to close a button here, if this button will be closed, 
this zero that is here will override the one that is on port B0, right? So the port B0 uh, will have a zero, all right? So the reason why I'm sending all ones to the ports is because I want to have a way of telling if for some reason uh, somebody placed the button, I may have the two codes here that are going to be in play. So the first code is that if I have got all ones in port B7, remember the ones in the port, they could be all ones, ones, whatever it was, zero B. Oh, it's kind of crazy, right? So I can have all ones. So I have that. So I can have all ones in a port. So I can have all right. So this, according to the positions, this is put B zero. This is port B7. Okay. So if I connect a button here on port B0, if I'm going to close this button, this will become zero. And if the button is not pressed, we have all ones, including port B0. And so if the button is pressed, then we have one, 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 zero. So the reason why I'm putting all ones is because I need to have a way of telling if the button has been pressed. All right, I need to have a way of telling. I need to have a way of uh, of telling if the button has been what has been pressed. Now, so uh, so I go back to the problem now. Now I'm at this level, so. I give both the status, so I give high, I give port B as by loading once. So how about port A? So port A is an output port because it is, we're going to load once to the data direction register. So we're saying DDR A comma temp, configure port A as an output port, right? But then what should be the status of port A? Remember in port A, at port A0, this is where we have placed our LED, right? So here, this is port A0. We've placed our LED there. So for the just sake of it, we've said all of them are output ports, but we also have just made all of them as the status, as having all status, meaning there's no data there. All right? Dora. Okay, so now here is the problem, and I'm gonna explain. I'm going to explain real quickly here. So the first thing that we're gonna do, we're going to try to read from the port and the way we read from the port and the way we want to copy we we want to copy the status of the port so this is what we're doing we're saying in term pin b what this instruction means it simply means that copy the status of port b and take it to a register called temp all right and then now when you take that into temp now the second instruction is to test whether what we copied into temp matches this code, this binary number. Now, this binary number, if you look at it very carefully, uh, it's a binary number that shows the code for a press button. Now, let me explain here. There is no direct way because once you've initialized everything, you, in the main problem now, you begin to think, how do we make our problem work? So the logic here is the logic. The logic is that we want somebody, when somebody closes the button, we want our LED to come on. So we need to start thinking, what should be the first statement that we need to write in the main program? Because in the main program, this is where we think about the algorithm of the program. So the first thing that you want to do is that you want to read, you want to copy the status of the button and take it to the uh, the register called temp. 
Now, I want to also mention, this is something that you've not seen. In the main program, what we do, the main program starts with the label start, and in the end, it ends with a label called uh, RJMP start. In other words, it's actually performing in a loop. It goes, it starts with the label, hits the end, and then the, the program again tries to go back and perform what is under that label. So, um, so the first instruction that we need to look at whenever we want to test if the button has been pressed is to copy. This is a technique. You copy what is on the port, take it to a temporal register. In this case, we have R16 that we've defined. And then the next instruction is to compare the content of the register, compare it to the constant value. Now, if you look at this value that we're comparing with, is a value for the press button. Because remember that when we don't know, if somebody presses the button, we don't know. We So whenever somebody, we so we always try to copy to the temporal register to see the status of the button. Somebody may have pressed the button or they may not have pressed. If they they haven't pressed the button, if we copy the status of port B, we copy to the temp. If they haven't pressed the button, then temp has got all ones on port B. If they have pressed the button, then temp has got all ones and except the last one, which was port B0. So this is a neat way, guys, to test using the in temp command. But I want to also mention that you should master the temp, the in command, because the in command comes with in register, then pin B. It doesn't speak to a port. It actually speaks to the pin. And it's very important. So here we are copying the status of port B, taking it to a register. And then we are trying to compare using the CPI. We're saying, is the content of the register equal to the code for a press button? Because this is really is the code for a press button. Is this guy equal to that? So when you do the copy, now you compare. Uh, is what in temp code with, with the same as this? Because now this is the code 111110 is a code for a switched on button. So we compare what is in temp. If they are equal, then we say break if equal, because the break command says if they're equal, break to a label code switch on the LED. Now, this is the label code switch on LED. And what do we do under this label? So this is how the program is going to work. On this one, it compares if they are equal. And then this one says break if equal, if what you had compared. So this one just compares. Okay? And then this one makes a decision. If you found that they were equal, please jump to a label and that label is switch on LED. All right, so it's going to switch on LED. So what do you put under the label? Well, under the label, you put a code for a switch on button. And this is pretty easy, guys. All I did was to load 0, 0, 0, 0, and 1, and put A0, making sure that put A0 is 1, and then we're out putting that value to put A, so meaning that we're switching on the LED. But when we reach the end, we should remember to go back. So we go back to check if the status has changed because now here we keep on copying in fact we go back through this way to check again if the status has changed if the status hasn't changed this guy will take 1110 1110 into temp and then the comparison will take place and the break if equal command says go and switch on the LED it will switch on but again it should keep on going back to make sure that the status hasn't changed if the status has changed then what is going to be copied if somebody lifts off the finger there'll be ones taken to temp and then we're going to compare what is in temp with all of these ones so if we if this is all ones and then there is one 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 zero then the break if equal command in this case will be ignored the next instruction will perform so if let's say for example this what is in here is not equal to there the break if equal command will be ignored and what will perform is this third instruction so now we need to just start thinking here if 
let's say the contents are equal then we have the mandate to switch on the led by making the break if command jump to a label if somebody has lifted off the finger we should provide a code once the break if ego command is ignore or ignored the only command that can perform is a command for a button not pressed so if we say the button not pressed, the button not pressed will mean that keep everything in the off state so this is what is going to happen so how do we keep everything in the off state well we need to make sure that if somebody hasn't pressed the button we jump and make sure that we load zeros into port a like we've done but when we reach the end we should also make sure that if nobody pressed the button maybe somebody quickly quickly has pressed the button we should always remember to go back and read if no one has pressed the button we compare the break if equal command is not going to perform but then we load zeros into 10 and make sure that port a is actually in the off state guys that was pretty fast and there's a lot of information to digest right here but i want to also mention that uh, we're going to have a detailed discussion as well in class but this is how a simple program like this uh, works now if you see here this is exactly what has happened so you can see here that the button was actually pressed this button was actually pressed and when it was pressed you can see here this zero which the blue here in process means a zero a zero came in and the red means ones so we had one 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 and a zero so we say okay all right so as far as the temp was concerned it now temp had one 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 zero when we compared with one 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 zero we went ahead and we switched on the led and this is the one that you see right here now for now guys i'd like to really appreciate you uh for your patience uh, of watching this video but i will actually come in the next class where i'll show you indirect addressing thank you so much for uh your time Thank <laughs> you.